Welcome, welcome, welcome to Extract Talks. How are you guys doing today? We have a very special guest uh, that's joining us today. We're going to be talking about all things nano. It's going to be really, really, really exciting. We have Dr. Alexi here with us. He's an expert in these fields, has a doctorate, and uh, I'll go ahead and let you introduce yourself, Dr. Alexi, if you would, and tell us your background, how you got into this field, really what you're doing in the field right now, and then we can kind of get into the details of all things nano. I am Alexi Peshkovsky. My last name doesn't fit on many forms <laughs> and it's difficult to pronounce. Pishkovsky? Pishkovsky. It's yeah. actually phonetic, but but it's scary. So yeah. if, if you attempt it, it typically works out, but uh, people are afraid to attempt it. Right. I am president and chief scientific officer of industrial sonar mechanics. We specialize in the technology for mixing things that don't like to mix. Uh, for example, oil and water. We make it possible to convert oils into what appears to be a water soluble state. Although if you get down to the details of it, technically not true, but it behaves as if it were for all intents and purposes, it's the same. We offer everything that people need to convert their oil compatible lipophilic bioactive extracts into water compatible forms. So we enable companies to make their own water soluble CBD, THC, Delta-8, yeah. uh, everything. And it doesn't have to be cannabis related, could be any oil compatible. Any bioactive. oil, you can get it into the water and then use that in formulations and things like that, right? So Precisely. You, yeah. you convert it into something that appears dissolve in water so you can make beverages out of it and all kinds of edibles and things that act much faster and the viability is much higher. They start to behave more like alcohol behaves yeah. in a much, much more rapid and predictable manner. So you can kind of titrate, titrate your dose up and everything is quicker and much more reproducible and whatnot. Right. Uh, what we do specifically is we offer ultrasonic equipment that is necessary to break the particles down to the nano range. And the other side of the story is formulations. Uh, so we offer several all-in-one nano stabilizer type products that can enable you to make translucent liquid nano emulsions, for example, or water soluble powders that reconstitute into nano emulsions, uh, things like that. We also it's contract manufacture exciting. in select cases, mm -hmm. but it's not typical for us to do that. We're not a B2C, we're business to business mostly. We started about 15 years ago, uh, working mainly in the pharmaceutical field, providing equipment to the pharmaceutical companies. Are you trained as a pharmaceutical scientist or organic or what is your background and training? So, so my undergraduate, which I have from the University of Pennsylvania, was in chemistry. And then my PhD in Columbia University was in physical chemistry, where I was mainly trained in instrumentation development for magnetic resonance, NMR. Did you do all the particle in a box calculations <laughs> using the uh, Hamiltonian? Yeah, yeah we did. <laughs> well, as a physical chemist, you have to do that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> A lot of Schrodinger stuff, mm -hmm. kind of there. but but there was a lot of electrical engineering involved too because I was mainly on the instrumentations development side. So uh, it was devices uh, mainly uh, they were called coils while I was working with NMR, and then they became well they, they were also like uh, uh, antenna designs. Uh, right. I switched to MRI after I graduated. I worked I yeah, I did three postdocs and. Two in MRI and one in something called NQR, which I did in Argentina, which was maybe the best part of my life where I, I lived for some years in Argentina and, and worked in explosives detection. Why not? not? I mean, that's a kind of a good place to be. Um, you know, that's a good technology to actually, you know, because it's so it's selective, right? It's, qu it's quite selective, very selective. You are? Yeah, it's like MRI or yep. MR, except there's no magnet. So you can okay. actually look. With MRI, you look into people's heads and see their brains, but you need to stick them into this magnet. You couldn't do that with a suitcase because there's a lot of metal in it and we'll just get attracted and, and right. destroy it. But NQR is kind of like a weird technique that lets you do some of that with certain type of nuclei. Uh, nitrogen-14 is one of them. And that's part of explosives. Pretty mm -hmm. much all explosives have it. Right. Um, and you can use this NQR and then you don't need a, a magnet so you can look into people's suitcases. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> that's uh, good. You know, I think it's a good place to look for explosives because there aren't any or none, none, none yeah, of a significant right. number because the last right. thing you want is to find an explosive. 
So you did uh, a postdoc with- there in Argentina, uh, and you got your PhD in Colombia, and you it was primarily Columbia university. It wasn't Colombia. The country. Oh, okay, was- that's awesome. And then, how did you get into ultrasonics? So my father, his entire life is an ultrasound physicist. He developed what we call the barbell horn ultrasonic technology. Yeah, he did this in the Soviet Union. Uh, I'm originally Russian from, well, I guess you can tell by the accent, from Moscow. And so my father worked in uh, high intensity ultrasound technology. There was an enormous government related, I guess, contract. That, what what uh, institute did he work in? He was working in several institutes, but among among them in the, the Russian Academy of Science. Okay. In Moscow and, uh, and then the Polymer Institute. Their task was to scale up without losing the intensity. So they were trying to increase the size of ultrasonic equipment without losing the intensity of ultrasound that it can produce, which is a very challenging and completely unsolved issue until the, the principles of the barbell horn were formulated, which, which is his achievement. But uh, the, the Soviet Union kind of fell apart before it became something mm-hmm. specific. And so it was left in his hands. Nobody cared and all the knowledge, just nobody needed it anymore. And so he kept it and he was trying to get me interested in it so we could do something about it. Right. But I was doing my MRI related stuff. I had another business. We, we were making MRI uh, detectors for hospitals and stuff. And, and I didn't really want to do it for a while. But then while I was living in Argentina, life became much more gentle and, and friendly and, and, and good to your, <laughs> to your parents. So I s- seriously considered it for the first time while I was living there. And immediately it turned out that it's, first of all, extremely versatile, very interesting, and luckily very similar to what I was doing because all the mathematics and, and the physics of basically wave propagation, be it mechanical waves in the, in the case of ultrasound or electromagnetic waves in the case of MRI, but all the, the principles are the same. So it, he, he, he trained me uh, uh, to convert into that field and, and I was kind of readily uh, prepared to do that. And, and we started the, the company, Industrial Sun and Mechanics, in 2004, okay. I think. And then we formally started in 2006. Great. Uh, registered in New York. Did you write any grant proposals or? Uh... Oh, lots of grant proposals. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, NIH grants, uh, but our first our first thing was to patent the barbell horn uh, technology principles. So we did that, and then we, we we patented several continuations of that and other things. So there's a nice portfolio for protecting this ability to scale up from the lab to the industrial scale, and this is what the kind of the core technology is. And then our initial work. Uh, was with the pharmaceutical industry and lots of grants were written to the NIH for that and, and yeah. stuff like that. Um, but the pharmaceutical uh, industry is difficult to work with. When it works out, it's great, but it's difficult to get it to go because they're very regulated and they're very heavy and there's just a lot right. of stuff that you need to overcome. Yeah. And as a small company, it's Lots hard of barriers. To... So <laughs> we were struggling, uh, but our equipment was developed for making nano nano emulsions and nano crystal suspensions for them because Mm -hmm. what they do is drug delivery, much like the cannabis industry. They want to deliver something that's not water compatible into the predominantly water-based human body. And so we developed our systems for that, but they typically had their own formulations. They they didn't really need surfactants and and the explanation of how to formulate. They they know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And then the cannabis industry about five years ago came along and exploded with the same exact requirement to deliver this cannabis based oil bioactive into the right. uh, bloodstream. We were completely ready on the equipment side. We had it all accidentally just so happened that we had it all developed and we switched into it. And in the beginning, we were training people, explaining how to formulate because in the cannabis industry, unlike the pharmaceutical people generally didn't know how to do that. Right. And then at some point we realized that it's just easier and better for the company to one formulations where people don't have to think they just take it and all they need is to add their cannabis extract and right and follow magic the <laughs> yeah and, and push button and chemistry we love that <laughs> you know ipod chemistry that's what i like to call it <laughs> turnkey solution basically yeah uh, so that's that's what we do until now uh we've expanded in powders and we can basically adjust it for anything but typically 
uh, the existing nanostabilizer have very broad spectrum. They can handle all kinds of extracts, all kinds of raw materials. Mm -hmm. But if something is different, alkaloids, for example, tend to be slightly different. You need to reformulate. We can always adjust to that. So, so that's us in a nutshell. I think it took longer than. <laughs> no, it's, it's all sounds very, very interesting. Let's just talk about the surfactants, maybe the difference between self-emulsified systems and, and what you guys are doing. I mean, people have their own formulas for fat soluble delivery. There's all kinds of different ways to go about doing it. There's different types of emulsions. Then there's obviously the self-emulsified systems that, that people are selling that you can buy. So how does the industrial sun of mechanics really fit into that sphere of different products? What would be the positives and negatives? And why would you choose the sonic? way of doing a nano emulsion versus a, a different way. Sure. So um, self-emulsified systems belong to the class of micro emulsions. Micro emulsions were extensively used by the pharmaceutical industry before nano emulsions came into play. The idea behind micro emulsions is to put a substantial amount of very well-developed surfactant system into the water so much that the properties of water change and, and it can solubilize the oil. It's no longer really water. It's this water with surfactant mixture mm -hmm. that the oil can go into, not exactly a solution, but uh, rather a micellar suspension. It's uh, very similar to nano emulsion in principle. You end up with about 20 nanometer size nano droplets, but sometimes it turns out to not be exactly a spherical uh, droplet suspension. It could be uh, a bicontinuous system. They're, they're basically the surface tension of the water oil interface gets relaxed so much that the oil can coexist with water. Mm -hmm. It becomes compatible right. uh, cl as close to the solution as you can get. The advantage is, is that this is thermodynamically driven, meaning it's in a thermodynamic minimum. So it's a self assembling system. You don't really have to put a lot of energy into it for it to happen. So you don't need special equipment. You just need to gently heat it up and stir it, not even very vigorously. But there are some very serious disadvantages. Specifically, first of all, you need a lot of surfactant, a lot more than the oil that, that you have right. in there, the, by a factor of 10, sometimes a lot more. Now, these resulting micro emulsions are stable, but they're easily destabilized if you change something because the interface is relaxed, the, the surface tension is mm -hmm. relaxed when everything is properly balanced and optimized. But if you change the pH, if you heat it up, if you dilute it sometimes, if sometimes if you look at it sideways, <laughs> right. it, it separates. And the surfactants that you have to use, you're, you're limited to a pretty harsh ones because they have to have a very strong effect. And basically that's because you're driving the process forward using the chemical energy mm -hmm. and the chemical energy after the process is completed of the formation of these, of these micelles, the surfactants are still there. You can't remove them mm -hmm. and they have to be there in excess to maintain uh, the stability of, of this uh, microemulsion. So it's very easy to be out of compliance on non surfactants. Mm -hmm. Now they're horrible tasting. Typically they're very harsh. Yeah. So you end up with, very aggressive things. Now, if you're sick, it's a pharmaceutical product, then people typically don't complain because they just want to they just want to live. But if it's a, a product you're voluntarily consuming, got to taste food, good. It's got to look good. It's got to smell good. All that stuff, right? It's very difficult. But you don't need any specialized equipment. The advantages of nano emulsions are that the amount of surfactant is easily by a factor of ten less. The choices of surfactant is much broader. You, you can use very mild, very organic food grade, compatible with the customer friendly stuff. And the energy that the ultrasonic system puts into the liquid in order to drive the process forward, once you turn the system off, is no longer there. So right. the consequences of how you got there are not represented in the finished product. So you don't have to live with the history of how you got there. You right. just have the minimum necessary amount of surfactant to maintain what you've created. Creating it is much harder than maintaining it. You're talking about maybe 10% by volume or 10% by weight with a typical sonomechanical process versus like a 25 to 30% by weight. So typically with microemulsions, you have a factor of something like one to 10, the amount of your oil to the amount of surfactants. I see. Uh, sometimes even more. We provide nanostabilizer, which is usually in the ratio of five to one, 
five nanostabilizer to one cannabis oil. But most of nanostabilizer is not surfactant. So in the end, when you look at how much surfactant versus oil you have, it's less than one to one. There's less surfactant than the amount of oil that you have in your formulation. It right. has all kinds of other things that are neutral and are there for other reasons. Are so, those surfactants typically on the label? So when the people look at them, they, they have them listed yeah. at what the label, what the, what's in it? Yeah. yeah, we provide the list of ingredients so people know mm -hmm. what's in there. But there's a catch. You need specialized equipment. It's, yeah. it's a one-time cost, uh, but it's there. So that, that's What are you looking at for, s suppose someone wants to make uh, 200 gallons a, a day or something like that. And typically, would you make a concentrate and then dilute it? Could they do that or do they have to have the equipment size for the larger volume? So you don't <clears throat> process the product. Uh, you process a concentrate nano emulsion. Mm -hmm. So typically, let's say if you're making a liquid nano emulsion and you want it to be translucent, so it goes completely transparent when you put it in your 200 gallons of water, then you don't see it, don't perceive it, but it's there. You would be making a nano emulsion with, let's say, 40 milligrams per milliliter. We mm -hmm. can go up to about 50 without any issues with translucency. After that, it gets a little bit more difficult, but 40 is a very comfortable number. So one milliliter would contain four 10 milligram doses of prestige. I see. Okay. So you would need to have a substantial volume then. Um, and that would be right, pretty much maximal on what you could do. I mean, maximum concentration typically. If you're, if you're looking for a translucent nano emulsion with approximately 25, 27 nanometer droplet size. Yeah. If translucency is less important, and because you're going to be diluting it, translucency of the concentrate could be less important. It's not a slight haziness that you barely perceive could allow you to go up to 100 uh, milligrams per milliliter. I see. But even at 40, one milliliter means four units of your finished product. Right. And if your unit of finished product, let's say, is half a liter, that means you've dosed two liters with just one milliliter, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So for 200 gallons, you're producing uh, maybe... Uh, I can't do the math this is this quickly, but no, I just maybe yeah, maybe right. a couple of gallons. Of and that would all be done kind of at the bench scale, or do you need to have a flow through system? What 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 does one need to do to get that done? So it's it's entirely up to you. We offer three different systems. We call it lab, bench, and industrial scale. Although lab systems can make about a liter of concentrate an hour. That's mm -hmm. five thousand doses. At okay. The, at the higher concentration. Right. Our bench systems can make five liters of concentrate an hour. That's 25,000 doses an hour, right? Of 10 milligram doses. And our bigger system can make up to uh, about 20, 25 liters an hour. So that's 100, 125,000 doses an hour. Right. So that's, that's, that's a huge amount. 100,000 doses means you can dose 100, thousand units. Absolutely of, uh, huge. Is that a flow through system or how does that work? It's a batch continuous processing. So you could, you could just work in a beaker if you choose to, but that's not how typically people produce. Right. Uh, to produce, you typically have your tank, which we provide that it has its own integrated magnetically coupled mixer. It's very convenient. Like you basically put the, the ingredients all in that tank and then it recirculates through the ultrasound system and back into, into that same tank. And it just goes around until it's done. That that's simple enough. So you just yeah. and you can keep it hygienic. Then obviously push a button and wait. Yeah, and the seals on it. It's low pressure. It's zero to no pressure. So there's no there's no pressure. It's it could be open to the atmosphere. You could put a lid on it if you don't want it to contaminate. But there's no pressure. There are no little capillaries or little tight corners. Nothing. It's it's all completely open. You can start with pretty lumpy stuff as long as your pump or our pump. We we typically provide everything together. But you can use your pump. As long as the pump can move it, and we use peristaltic pumps so they can move slurries, you can even start with very gunky stuff and it will eventually all get processed, become translucent and very homogeneous and look like a semi-clear apple juice-like looking thing. Very good. Very good. That, that's nice. That's, that's, that's really nice. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, our customers, what they, what they really like is translucency. They like the fact that it doesn't have a lot of taste to it. And, uh, you know, they like the fact that it's also very efficacious. So what do you think about, you know, as you're bringing the nanoparticles down, obviously the surfactants are also being highly bioavailable. What do you know about the bioavailability the action of the surfactants and the um, stabilizers themselves? I mean, wh what what do you know about those? And can you, can you give some sort of idea as to, are they safe? The surfactants typically have to be very biocompatible. They mm -hmm. should be food grade, stuff that you can just eat with a spoon. Right. So we only eat stuff like that. There, there are no limits on how much you can consume today on those. There's no toxicity. There's no taste to them. The nanostabilizers are completely tasteless. 
So it's basically food. They don't really become more bioavailable when you use them like that because they would, on their own, dissolve in water. There is a high HLB and a low HLB uh, contribution. The high HLB surfactants simply dissolve in water. So if you consume them, sonication wouldn't change how they behave because they just get into solution, but they get digested before they get absorbed. So they, they get processed, only their components go in. And the low HLB surfactants we use, there are also naturally already present in your small intestine. So we try to match things that your body already knows what to do with. Right. Uh, it's also very important to point out that nanoparticles, nano droplets don't go in. Most people make this mistake uh, in thinking that if you make these nano droplet suspensions, then those nano droplet suspensions will end up in your blood. That's not what happens. They're only there to transport the cannabinoids to the internal wall of the small intestine, which right. is where everything falls apart and cannabinoids or other bioactives go in on their own. They penetrate as if they got there in some other way. The problem is that with edibles, they can't get there because they're not water soluble. Right. So in your small intestine, you have to convert them using your internal surfactant and some motion of, of the gut into a micro emulsion, basically a micellar suspension, mm -hmm. which then very similar to the nano emulsion. It's basically a nano droplet suspension, which can travel and get absorbed. But that, that takes about an hour to even get going properly. That's, that's why when you consume an edible, you don't feel anything for at least an hour. Then after an hour and a half, you made enough micelles that they now get to where they get absorbed and start getting absorbed. Right. With our emulsions, we just do that outside of the body. So you skip this whole hour and a half and you don't smear it in terms of time. That's why it comes in all together. And quickly in doing so, it feels like a glass of wine because alcohol dissolves in water. So right. it will mimic that. It's ready to, to get absorbed. Ready to get absorbed. I mean, that that's that's awesome. Can you tell me a little bit about what kinds of cannabinoids would you typically use? A lot of our customers, okay, do I need to use isolate or can I just use crude oil? What is the best oil? What is the best isolate? You know, what do you think is the best? And um, a lot of people are interested in the entourage effect. Well, you could do this with terpenes, for example, right? So yeah, this is, the, this is a good question that is very typical. And the kind of the counter question is, it depends on what you mean by good. On our end, as far as the quality of nano emulsion that you can create with it, it almost doesn't matter what you're starting with. And I'm, I, this is going to be my question to you. The only requirement that we have is that uh, your extract be at least winterized. Uh, heavy waxes are a problem. Okay. They, they, they have different properties than the normal oils, and they can also be nano emulsified, but they tend to take a lot longer and they are less stable. So if you remove the heavy waxes that are useless and bitter and you don't want them anyway, uh, by winterization, not necessarily by fractional distillation, that would be even better, but it's not necessary. So just winterization also removes chlorophyll, which is another thing you don't want them there. And the xanthophylls are no problem? Uh -huh. the, the, the other pigments that are in there are no problem as well? Because they, you know, well, they'll stay kind of stay uh, in there. They're ubiquitous. It's better to it's better not to have chlorophyll in there. Okay. So winterization basically takes care of both of those things. And so from that point forward, everything is the same. You can take it all the way to an isolate or to a very pure distillate, or you can stop anywhere in the full spectrum, broad spectrum. Right. You could convert it to delta eight. You can do whatever you want with it, as long as it doesn't have the waxes and some very different stuff from it, which is like chlorophyll, it's not an oil, it's, it's some in-between thing. When it's something that would dissolve in a vegetable oil, let's say an olive oil, if you could just dissolve it in that and, and get a normal clear solution, that means that you can create a, a high quality nano emulsion from it. Now, if by good you mean the effect, that's not really a question for me. It's a personal preference yeah. and it's a question, for, you know, medical professionals. What about bioavailability? It should be the same, right? The bioavailability increases. Take the it. logic is simple. So why is the bioavailability of a typical edible so low? That's because it arrives in your small intestine as a blob of oil, and now it has to get converted into these micelles. It takes a very long time to do. So it's in competition with elimination, which is going through your system. It takes so long that most of it is gone by the time it's ready to go in. And also it's smeared so much that maybe it is going in, but it's under the radar. If you look at the peak of intensity, it slowly grows, then it gets intense, but then it drops and then there's this infinitely long tail where something is going in, but like, is it really? Mm -hmm. And it takes hours and hours, maybe 15 hours. So all of that area under the curve where the substance is maybe going in, it's not really doing anything 
therapeutic or recreational for you. It's happening while you sleep probably, and, and it's not in concentrations that are reasonable. And so all of that area under the curve is thrown away. So what you're left with is only what's above some line where you can perceive it or have a benefit. And that area is much smaller than the entire thing. Now, if you could take the whole peak and just squish it, mm -hmm. make it very tall and, and narrow, then everything would be above that line. So that's what happens with nanomolgins. Because they're ready to go and they don't need to wait for this process to occur, once you consume them, they are all in. They last for a couple hours, maybe three hours. And after that, they just go go out. And you can feel it if it's THC. We, we hear this, these reports all the time. For Delta A, 10 minutes, especially on an empty stomach, followed by a meal. It's good to take it on an empty stomach and eat maybe five, 10 minutes later. Yeah. Five, 10 minutes later, you can perceive it. 15 minutes later, it's definitely there. Half an hour later, it's maybe at the top, maybe 35 minutes or so. So at the top, then it stays flat for two hours, two and a half maybe. After three hours, you can feel that it's dropping. Mm -hmm. After four hours, it's gone. You can drive home. I see. That's very, that's great. It's, it's a glass of wine. Have you ever um, used a nano emulsion in like um, using it sublingually rather than taking it through the gut? And is there an advantage to doing that? No. So it's sometimes believed that if you put nano emulsion under your tongue, that it's going to go in under your tongue. But what, what people don't realize is that there's a constant flow of saliva that you produce and, and swallow. And because this is a water compatible thing, it mixes with your saliva and you swallow it and you don't even know you're doing it. Right. It's not, you, you're not keeping it under the tongue long enough for it get, to get absorbed. And there's no need to, mm -hmm. because it gets absorbed just fine in the small intestine, which is actually probably a better place for it, because all the checks and balances that the evolution developed for us to control poisons and things, mm -hmm. they, that's they're in the small intestine. They're not when you inject it straight into the blood or use your, your lungs or even sublingual, because then you avoid, avoid the liver, which sometimes you may want to do. But not always. In the case of THC, it's not it's not necessarily what you want to do because the first metabolite is 11 hydroxy THC, which is a stronger and a faster acting type of THC anyway. So you may want to go through your liver. For CBD, it's actually quite the opposite. But what you could do if you want more of a sublingual absorption is to make a water compatible powder and compress it into a tablet that you keep under your tongue. I see. Then it slowly gets released under your tongue and more of it goes in. Mm -hmm. Some people say that it acts a bit faster, but it's really difficult to detect the difference between, you know, 10, 15 minutes and five, seven minutes. Right. And who cares anyway? Exactly. Do you use the same exact uh, process to do your powders or do you process it in the liquid and then spray it? Or what's your process there? Yeah. So it's, it's a different nano stabilizer mm -hmm. that you would use for powders. And the, your first step is the same. You would make a liquid nano emulsion, but this other nano stabilizer, it's called nano stabilizer LSO, is produces nano emulsions that can be dry. They can be spray dried. Spray drying is a good method to do it. It leads to a very nice type of powder, but there are other methods to dry it and they all basically work well with it. You don't need to add anything. It already contains all the excipients. So when you dry it, you remove the water and the excipient takes its place. So it's still a nano emulsion, except it's a solid. It's like a sugar derivative that takes place of water and nano droplets of oil are suspended in that now. But once that goes in the water, the sugar derivative dissolves out and nano droplets are released back in the water. So it reconstitutes it into where it came from, which is the original nano emulsion. And that happens in your saliva. So if it's a fast disintegrating tablet that you made, for example, right. it's a beverage that you didn't need to drink. It's your saliva based beverage. Right. But you use essentially the same surfactant and the same, the nano uh, stabilizer that you would use, or would they be different for a powder versus a liquid? Uh, different. So okay. for, if, if you know that you're making liquids that you don't need to dry, then there are better surfactants that get you to a higher degree of translucency and the smaller droplet size. They're optimized for liquids, but they cannot be dried because the surfactants that you're starting with are not solid and there's no excipient. There's no binder that would replace the water should you evaporate it. So if you evaporate the water from that, then you're just going to get this gunky you know, surfactant oil mix. But a nanostabilizer LSO is specially designed to be dried in, and it uses solid surfactants right. and solid excipients. They're dissolved in water when you're making that emulsion, but you remove the water and they take its place. Right. You know, a lot of our the equipment is the same thing. Equipment is the same. The, that, that's wonderful. Yeah. A lot of our customers use high pressure stator cells basically to make their emulsions and and how does your technology compare with that is there an advantage from the standpoint of usability or maybe you can comment on that for our customers yeah so there were two things that i heard in this there was a high pressure and the stator cell yeah and that's actually two things so there is a rotor stator homogenizer mm -hmm. 
type. That's when there are slots in. And those are high pressure cells though, right? Aren't they? Or for... high pressure homogeneity work well, achieve nano emulsions just like the ultrasound, mm -hmm. but they have lots of disadvantages. They use very small capillaries that you get clogged very easily. Mm -hmm. They're also a lot more expensive. Uh, they have much bigger footprint and they use a lot of power, a lot of electricity. We've dealt with them a lot in the pharmaceutical industry because when we were coming into the pharmaceutical industry, they already had high pressure homogenizers basically doing that work. And they were very large, very expensive, but it was difficult to compete with them because in the pharmaceutical industry, once you get your product protocol approved by the, the FDA, you can't switch out to different equipment. You have to go through the approval process again. That was the major hurdle. But in the cannabis industry, we don't see a lot of that. Only people who come directly from a pharmaceutical industry and are not familiar with the alternatives tend to just use what they know. But people who consider things from scratch typically don't go that direction. Mm -hmm. Our systems can occupy a portion of a desk. Right. High pressure homogenizers take up half a room and, and will cost, you know, half a million bucks. Right. Where our equipment is 30, 40,000. Know, yeah. I mean, a lot of our customers have really purchased those. They're very, very expensive. I've seen that happen. And um, so then how would your price compare to something like a high pressure homogenizer, for example? We're an order of magnitude lower for the same or higher productivity and better results, basically. Very good. Very, very good. Another thing is high pressure homogenizers are typically single pass systems. So you have to go from one reservoir to another, and then you switch places and you do discrete passes, mm -hmm. which is a whole other thing. You have to keep doing something. With our systems, you just press a button and, and wait for it to be done. Right. If it takes two hours, you come back in two hours. If, right. If it takes six, six, you know, they run 24 seven. Right, right. Okay. But to be fair, results wise, there are not all of them, but there are high pressure homogenizers that lead to good results. Okay. Well, I sure they are. I mean, I would expect it to be, you would obviously specify the performance of it before you purchased it and then you would test it and it ought to be within the ranges that you would expect. So I'd imagine that. So our customers and your customers, they typically have to have specialized equipment to like quality control testing, or what do you recommend for that aspect of your solution? There are two things to test for. One is obviously the potency. Do you have the, the CBD or THC or Delta 8 or whatever in the concentration that you expect in your finished product? And that you can do by HPLC. No problem. Or other right. methods. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing to know about this is because this is a water compatible product, the prep is a little different. So those who are used to dealing with oils need to realize that the solvents that you would use with oils are not the same ones that you would use with water-based products. Okay. Uh, typically, methanol-based mobile phase is what you would want to use with nano emulsions. Okay. All your sample prep would be done in methanol. That's what you're saying. So you would just dilute and shoot. Right. You would use the mobile phase, yeah. uh, methanol mobile phase, and you would pre-dilute your sample, be it a tablet, powder, or liquid. You would typically can tolerate some water. So even if it's a liquid nano emulsion, which is mainly water, you could just use that as a starting sample and dilute that into uh, methanol. Sometimes you, you need to uh, sonicate it lightly or um, in some way try to break the nano emulsion, but typically methanol breaks the nano emulsion on its own. Right. But you would want to vigorously stir it at least or shake it. So you'd um, vortex it, dilute it, you'd vortex it, put it in your vial and put it on the HPLC approximately. Yeah, okay. Something like that. And make sure it's the, the mobile phase is, is also methanol. Right. The Acetyl nitrile wouldn't work or typical reverse phase, any reverse phase, you know, organic solvent would be okay. Is, is that, is that the general guideline or do you need it, to it have, have an alcohol? It would have to be a, a type of solvent that can mix with the nano emulsion properly in order to get the cannabinoids out of it. So yeah, okay. uh, methanol is, is it just dissolves water, mm -hmm. dissolve each other. And so yeah. you will, it will have direct access to the droplets. Okay. Got it. Okay. Fair enough. If you're using an organic solvent, that's not miscible with water. You will have to get through the water to the droplet, but the droplet is compatible with water. So it's outside, it's hydrophilic and it will repel the, the, the solvent you're trying to use. And so it's an additional hurdle. Then you would need a lot of mechanical energy. You would need to sonicate uh, very strongly, maybe to break through that barrier, but it's unnecessary. Methanol is a very typical mobile phase to use and it works with HPLC or other types of liquid chromatographies. And, and okay. Probably for, for, for GC, you don't really even need to worry about that. 
No, I think you you can derivatize it there, or you can you know dissolve it, shoot it. It you know all the stuff's going to end up on the liner. <laughs> so right. that's why we use HPLC. So would you ever do a quality control aspect to this? And validate your method with particle size analyzer. Yeah. So so that's actually extremely. You absolutely have to measure droplet sizes because potency analysis is a given. That's just what you need to do for any product, and you could do the same for pesticides or, or whatever residual solvents. Like all of that stuff. That's just common for any product that you would be consuming. But droplet size speaks for the most important properties of the nanomolecule. Droplet size relates directly to the bioavailability, to the onset of action, to stability, to translucency. Basically, it's the best parameter to measure when you think about the quality of the nanomolecule. If it's a powder that's water soluble, then you still need to measure the droplet sizes after you reconstitute it in water. So you take the powder, put it in water, dissolve it, and then measure those droplets because even though we say dissolve it, it, it's actually not a solution. It goes back to a nano emulsion, or if it's not very well made, just emulsion. And then you have particles of a large size or a small size, the smaller, the better. Right. You ideally want to be in a range of 20 to 30 nanometers, because then you mimic mixed micelles that your body produces when it absorbs oils. Mm -hmm. So that's the target. But if you're double that, you're still okay. Uh, if you're below 100 nanometers, you're typically okay. If you're below 200 nanometers, you're in a nano emulsion range above that it starts to be unstable difficult to deal with and not performing very well what about under um, and smaller than that is does it become more bioavailable or is that not the case so it's diminishing returns there are graphs there, there's some really elegant works done for a range of bioactive uh, mainly in the pharmaceutical world but uh, the principles apply no matter what the bioactive is because it belongs more to the nano emulsion droplets than to the bioactive itself how it gets absorbed, right? You see an enormous change when you go from, let's say, 400 nanometers to 200. Then it's an enormous change when you go from that to mm -hmm. 100. Less so when you go to 60, uh, less so when you go to 40, a little bit when you go to 20, and almost nothing below that. Mm -hmm. So they tend to stop at 25, diminishing returns. Right. And that's probably because all you need, really, to be able to travel through the aqueous environment of your small intestine. And you're fine when you mimic a mixed micelles. Right. That, that's what your body is kind of optimized for. When you go to 10 nanometers versus 20 nanometers, there is no advantage. Right. Maybe a tiny amount that's not worth the effort. A machine here to make 15 nanometers than 30. Uh, so which machine maybe, Which machine do you need then to test all this? Right. So uh, this is a, actually a very, very good question. There are two techniques that are established for this. There's laser diffraction and dynamic light scattering. So laser diffraction works extremely well when all droplets are above 100 nanometers. It's beautiful if your nanomulsions are around 250 to 100 nanometers because it gives you volume distributions, which is what you want for this measurement directly. But if you're going to be below 100 nanometers, it's not the right technique. For that, you need dynamic light scattering. Dynamic light scattering doesn't give you volume distributions directly. It uses some mathematics to calculate them, so they're not perfect, but they're they're close enough. This is what's almost exclusively for translucent nanoemulsions. And we have both types of instruments and we almost never use the light scattering. The laser, the laser diffraction. Laser diffraction, yeah. sorry, laser diffraction. No, that's all good. So um, yeah, so that's, that's just a visible, is that, uh, that's just, uh, it's also a laser though, right? Yeah, they're, they're both very similar, except there is a slight difference. In laser diffraction, you, you have a laser that throws the beam at the suspension. And there's diffraction that makes the light scatter sideways. Right. And how far sideways it will go will depend on the size of the droplets. So then you have detectors positioned in kind of like a semicircle. Yes. And the relative intensity of the light that's scattered among all the detectors is used to build the distribution of the droplet size. I see. Dynamic light scattering uses motion. So there's Brownian motion of all the droplets. And you shine a beam of, of laser at that, and it, it scatters back into the detector. It's backscattering. Uh, okay. And it has a Doppler effect. By If they move towards the detector, then there's a blue shift. If they move away, then there's a red shift. And depending on all the frequency shifts, you can calculate all their motion. And because you know their density and the viscosity of the medium, from their motion, you can calculate their size. Very good. So okay. it's a less correct but much more capable of going down to small size. So you need a light scattering piece of equipment. You also need the equipment for the mechanical uh, sonication. Is there any other equipment that you really need to have to make this work? So the beauty of translucent nanoemulsions is that they're translucent. Yeah. Meaning you know 
that your droplets are below 100 nanometers, the entire distribution, when your nanomulsion becomes translucent. I guess a lucky coincidence, but it just so happens that the last visible light, way if you go in the shortening of the wavelength, mm -hmm. is violet, right? And that's about 400 nanometers. There is a, a wave propagation rule that if an obstacle of a wave is less than a quarter of that wave uh, length, then the wave will continue mainly unobstructed. So when all the droplets are below 100 nanometers, You're all not the light be able to see it, can, right? can just go straight forward. Mm -hmm. And so your formulation becomes translucent. You can see through it. It's not transparent in the sense that you detect that there's something in the way, but you don't distort what's in the way. You can see through it. You can read text through it. It doesn't just go scatter sideways and become hazy. You can see a direct beam of light through it. Then you already know that all your droplets are below 100. You don't know if there are 50 or, or 30, but you can use this kind of eyeball turbidity for basic quality control. So you don't even really need that equipment. Oh, okay. If you follow the protocol uh, and you're working with the oils that we already know about, mm -hmm. something within the cannabis range of, of normal things to use, and you use our nanostabilizer and our equipment, then by just looking at it, you can tell roughly what the droplet sizes are. Right. Visual. Like then you don't have to have the <laughs> testing equipment. You don't have to have the know-how. You don't have to do the calibrations, all of that. So you save $67,000 on that. That's yeah. The, that's expensive equipment. How do people typically validate in terms of process validation? What would the typical protocol be yeah, pretty so quick? It depends then? on the company. If they want to be more rigorous about it, yeah, then they actually of course. do random tests than they are for analysis or have in-house expertise. We find that a lot of people don't do any of that. Right. Maybe they test for potency every once in a while, but um, as far as droplet size, uh, either they don't worry about it at all or they eyeball it from translucency. Now, you can do it when you're making liquid translucent nanomolecules, but when you're making powders, there's nothing to see. It's a white powder. Right. Uh, when you reconstitute it, if it goes clear or translucent, great. If it doesn't, it, you, people typically tend not to worry about it too much. It's probably not the best idea, but we noticed that people at this point believe that that's good enough. I hope it changes in the future because the properties of the product change significantly depending on the droplet size. Yeah. But it's understandable because the equipment is expensive and yeah. it's complicated to do. I understand that too. Well, so. look, so I, I think that uh, we've had a really great uh, conversation here. I've learned a lot. It's been really great. How do our customers get a hold of you? Um, how do they get quotations from you? I mean, can you give us your website and um, how they can uh, engage with your company? The best way is to just go through our website. It's sonamechanics.com. S as in Sam, O, N as in Nancy, O in the word mechanics, mechanics of the sound, yep. sonamechanics.com. From there, you can get all kinds of information and pricing. We recently launched what we call pricing page. The pricing page is when you go to contact us and uh, there, there are several buttons, several directions you can go from there. One is get pricing or request a quote for a processor. That leads you to a page where you have the uh, a rendering of the system with all possible elements, including all kinds of peripheral items that you can click on and off. For each system and each configuration, there's six uh, categories of, of Very systems. nice. Very nice. Build your own system, the price changes as you go. So you don't have oh, to sweet. wait for us to send an official quotes. And if you want an official quote at the end of all that, then there's a button to submit it for, for a quote. Great. So we you can go on there and configure your own solution. R really great. It took a long time to make, but yeah. uh, we, we were all very excited about it. And, and we just recently launched it. So we're, we're all very happy about it. Good. And it seems to be popular. Uh, we also have a web store where people can buy nano stabilizer products uh, and accessories for systems and uh, some peripheral items, not entire systems, but pretty much everything but the entire system. And there's a, a link from our main website to the web store okay. um, that follow. So, yeah. Well, very good. Um, that's pretty much all they need. Just go to that website and you guys can get some automatic quotations. I think I'm maybe going to go there and Click through there and see, yeah, you'll see me with a little quotation <laughs> coming up. Yeah, who knows? I need some nano emulsifier for my coffee in the morning. <laughs> I'd like to, I'm going to try it with some caffeine, see how that really works. <laughs>
Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Dr. Alexi. We appreciate you and everything that your company is doing and uh, obviously uh, all of your knowledge there. And thank you for uh, you know doing some education with our customers. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And, and I would love to do this again when we do the same, but in reverse. Yes, uh, yes. I have We're game. Hey, I'm always game to talk to you. And uh, <laughs> and because uh, our conversations are different every time we talk. It's, it's really great. By the way, you you guys, they also have a podcast. Dr. Alexi does it. Um, obviously, you can tell he's got a very high level of talking. So it, please join his podcast if you can too. And uh, he's all about formulations. He's all about emulsions. He's going to be talking about the scientific aspects of those. And you're going to learn a lot just by talking to him for an hour. So appreciate you and I appreciate your time and, and uh, hope, hope uh, everything is well with you and take care. Take care. All right.